Thank you all. It is so good to be with family tonight. Now, I think, you know, Rachel, you're like the real deal family. You know what I mean? And I'm the real deal family grafted in because I'm the white girl from Kansas that y'all adopted. So thank you for making me a part of your family. Let's pray because I sense the Lord wants to do. Just stand up with me and pray. Father in heaven, we just call upon your name tonight. I thank you that you're here. I thank you you've brought us together as family. God, you put the lonely in families. You create cities and, and give them to families. I thank you that you're making this family overtake a city. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing here. Now, God, would you just be among us tonight? Holy Spirit, bring an impartation of your glory and of your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to thank you again. I've, I've had such an amazing time this week. And, uh, yeah, starting from the dance party. Now, if, if that wasn't any indication that I... I'm not a Hawaii girl. I don't know what was. So I hope you don't have video of me trying to dance, but that would be the proof right there. Uh, but I had, that was super fun. You do have video? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Posted that on social media. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> I missed out somewhere. I don't know. It's been really great. I love coming here to King's Chapel, Wasilla. I, I just, I love you guys. Pastor Daniel and Pastor Karen, you guys, I, I just want to honor you. I want to honor you as friends and as what God is doing here in this place. And in you, I just, we even talked about it this afternoon. I just recognize you are both walking in a new level of authority and in a place of the destiny of God, and I just honor that and affirm that in your lives. And I thank the Lord for the staff here in this place. You guys rock. You guys are anointed. You're filled with the Spirit. You're happy. You guys, do you all know what a gift you have in your staff? It's amazing. And you just always make me feel like I'm coming home. And I know that's how everybody that walks through these doors for the first time must feel. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. My husband, Randy, is, sends his greetings, sends his hello. He's wait, wait, watching on Facebook Live. So hi, honey. I'll be home tomorrow. There's hope. He's home with seven little people right now this weekend. And he's been sending me pictures of his survival plan. <laughs> It's included like Papa John's and the dollar store and just stuff. So, yeah, thank God for Randy Bolander. Thanks, honey. And Lou and Therese Ingle send their love. They, uh, they heard I was coming up, and they said, please send my love to the Brackens and to the King's Chapel family and to Wasilla. So they are here with us in spirit. Tonight... I want to bring a message that I told Pastor Daniel I probably wouldn't have chosen this one if I were thinking up something fun to bring you guys on a Sunday night. But the Lord would not let go. He apprehended my heart. And he said, this is the message that is to be released from Wasilla, Alaska. And so tonight... I may have a few tears. I've cried my makeup off twice today, and I can't promise it won't happen again. So if it does, y'all can cry with me or pat me on the back, whatever works. But I think it's the tears of the Lord tonight. Romans 8, 14 and 15, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We are sons of God because we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to slavery. But what did we receive? The spirit of adoption that we might cry, Abba, Father. He's our father. He's brought us in as sons and daughters of the most high God. He's calling his own, those who were not his own. Hosea 2. 
And tonight I want to dive into the spirit of adoption and how this relates to our cry for revival on the earth. Okay? Now, Pastor Daniel, this morning you talked to us about a different diet that you've been on, mostly. You know, and how you do things differently. You have a different diet when you're in crisis. Not that you're in crisis, but when you're in crisis, you do things differently. And I want to propose that we have a national crisis. If you haven't watched the news, we're in a national crisis. And you do things differently in crisis than in times of peace, don't you? You live differently. You band together. You do what you have to do for the sake of the common good, right? We're in a time of crisis. I like how John Tyson says it. We've got to live like we're in the fourth quarter. Right. Anybody watch the Chiefs game? You know, the one that cost us the Super Bowl? Yeah, that one. It was rigged, wasn't it? I don't even like football, but I watched that one. But I, I, I don't watch football, but I heard they play different in the fourth quarter, right? right. They, you don't play the same in the first quarter as the fourth quarter. Now I'm a soccer mom, so I'm just going to say it like this. In soccer... If you're tied or down one in the 87th minute, anybody play soccer? Okay, good. All right, you get it. In the 87th minute, you play differently. You, you might kind of just, if you're winning, you kick the ball around, you run out the clock. But in the 87th minute, if you're down, you are all out. Your team comes at, the goalie comes out of the box, and you are all about the goal. And I can't tell you how many pro soccer games I have been to where in the 87th minute it's like, whew, they all turn to be beasts. Right. And they've won in the 91st minute. We are in the 87th minute, folks. And we've got to play like we're in the 87th minute. We're call God is calling the goalie out of the box. And he's saying full court, all the way down, all the way down for the goal. We're in it to win it. So... We're going to talk about how to live in the 87th minute tonight. Now, since our last visit, I say R because I have my A team here on the front row. And I just love you guys. I have Becky Jackman here, pro A1 intercessor friend. You guys remember her? I have Terry Shukart from Kansas City. She's my new intercessor friend who's come all the way to Alaska to pray. Of course, Rachel. Rock star Rachel. <laughs> and I have my two Walsilla friends. They're going to kill me. But Christy and Pam, thank you guys for coming. Uh, but since we all have been together in Alaska the last time, uh, we've had a shift in our life. My husband, Randy, has gone on staff as senior pastor of Hillcrest Covenant Church. And with that shift came me shifting out of home and in, back into uh, the workplace. I, I took over as executive director of Zoe's, House, of Zoe's House Adoption Agency. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Many of you may know our story of how we went from three kids to 10 kids in a minute. Well, it was more than a minute. It was a few years, but it felt like a minute. It was like, whoo, how did that happen? I didn't see that coming. And it was all because of a prayer meeting on Capitol Hill during the year 2005, a little stinky prayer room with a bunch of stinky college kids <laughs> on Pennsylvania Avenue, looked out the window, could see the Capitol, and they just had the gumption that if they prayed for Roe v. Wade to be overturned and for God to end abortion, it might just happen. Be careful what you pray in those prayer meetings, folks. Those 7 a.m.s when you don't feel like coming, be careful what you pray. You might just change the world someday. If you haven't heard our story, it's a good one. It's only one of so many, and I'm not going to go deep into it. But at, just for background, at the end of 2004, we moved to Washington, D.C., felt a call to move with Lou Engle and, a, and another family, a bunch of crazy kids. We established the Justice House of Prayer which was a, a prayer room on Capitol Hill, uh, praying for the nation, praying for revival in the nation, praying for our leaders, but praying for the ending of abortion in America. We would stand at the Supreme Court daily. We started something called Bound for Life. If you've seen the red life tape, the red tape with the word life on it, we would stand in what we call the silent siege of prayer at the Supreme Court every day, sometimes 24-7 at the Supreme Court. That got a little uncomfortable. <laughs> especially in the cold. But one day in January 2005, it was probably the coldest day on record that year, 
during the March for Life, we're standing outside the court, and it's packed with protesters. And my son, Jackson, is there. He's 12, standing with us with life tape. All we're doing, folks, is praying, and we're doing it silently, and we're not bugging anybody. But we bugged some people. Some people got stirred up and bugged. And this protester came, and he stood behind my son, and he yelled in his ear, what are you going to do if you win? What are you going to do with all the babies? Y'all don't even want the babies. Y'all are just wanting this to end. What are you going to do with them? And it was like, ouch, that hit. And so we went back to our prayer meetings. And these radical college kids asked the Lord, what are we going to do about that? And God showed us that adoption was the next frontier of the pro-life movement for the ending of abortion. And this 22-year-old kid, Brian Kim, poli-sci major, who had a dream about putting life tape. If we put life tape on our mouth and stood in front of the court, it might catch the attention of the nation. And it might catch the attention of heaven. And something might happen. And he says to us in a meeting, Bullenders, your call to adopt. Adoption is going to be the extension of your intercession. And I'm thinking, I have three boys. I kind of wasn't planning on that. And you're 22. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> and then he said, privately, he came to us, handed us a check for $500. Now get this. He, this is a 22-year-old kid who's given a season of his life to come pray. He doesn't have a job. He gives us 500 bucks. And he says, this is for that big white van you're going to need someday when you have all those kids. So we moved back to Kansas City by a divine act of God about a year later. And we started asking the question, how do we do this? How do we adopt for the ending of abortion? And we just started raising a few bucks because we knew adoption was expensive. And Lou Engel was having a big tent revival in South Carolina in July 2006. Who has a tent revival outside in South Carolina in July? Woo! But he called me and said, Kelsey, why don't you come and why don't you just give like a three, four minute announcement of what you're going to do. And maybe we'll take a justice offering and y'all can add that to your adoption fund. I'm like, I'm down. So I flew to South Carolina ready to make an adoption announcement. And that afternoon, just he kind of walks by me. And he said, hey, by the way, tonight, take the whole service. I'm like, what? What do you mean take the whole service? Just preach. Just preach the whole service. Guys, I had three minutes prepared. <laughs> I, had, I didn't know what to say. I had nothing. So I'm like, I better go get some coffee and hear from God. Because <laughs> remember, coffee makes me a better person. <laughs> so I went to a coffee shop in Fort Mill. I had three hours. And I'm telling you, those three hours in the coffee shop changed our lives forever. Hear me. I, I don't, I told my friends this. I said, I don't talk like this, do I? They're like, no. But I'm telling you, in that coffee shop that day, I'm convinced there was angelic activity. I believe the Lord dropped this message in my heart because I've never experienced anything like that before or since then. And that night, I preached a message about adoption. I'm going to preach part of it tonight because I feel responsible for the message. Because 13 years later and seven more kids later, I'm watching the nation accelerate toward a dark abyss, and we've got to do something about it. I cannot remain silent, and neither can you. On January 22nd of this year, it was the 46th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, and in the state of New York... They passed the Reproductive Health Act that now allows a mother to choose abortion up until the time of delivery to protect her health. But it can be the mental health, you know, if she just isn't feeling up to it. In Virginia, the governor was in a radio interview. If you didn't see it, you might want to watch that one. He said that it would be up to kind of the, the mother and the doctor what they would do if that baby was born alive after an abortion. 
kind of up to the doctor and the mother. They could kind of choose. It's called infanticide. In the state of Maine this week, they, the governor introduced legislation that non-doctors can perform abortions. In light of all this, I want to circle back to a passage Pastor Daniel brought forth this morning. You just touched on it. But 1 Kings 16, 20, 34, you read that, that Hiel built Jericho and he laid its foundation with its firstborn and he set up its gates with its young, his youngest. Doesn't mean that he put them to work, guys. This was, Bethel was the capital of Baal worship. And in Baal worship, they sacrificed their children. And this was a fulfillment of the curse in Joshua. Joshua 6.26 said, Cursed be the man who rises and builds Jericho. Because what you're going to do is you're going to do it with, you're going to lay its foundations with your firstborn. And you're going to build its gates with your youngest. In America, 46 years after Roe v. Wade, we're full of bloodshed. And the, our land is saturated in the blood of innocence. Blood is at the gates, blood is in the foundation, and silence is no longer an option. See, Hiel worshipped Baal, and it, archaeologists have found bones in jars in the foundations of the walls, buried under the gates. They believed that if they sacrificed their young, it would ward off evil. What it does in America, it wards off God. That's why we're in a crisis. Silence is not an option. Even if it's hard to listen, even if it's hard to watch the news, even if it's easier to ignore it, we can't. Because like Ellie Weisel said, Ellie Weisel was a Holocaust survivor, Nobel, P Nobel Prize winner, and he said in his acceptance speech, if we forget... We are accomplices. Action is the only remedy to indifference. And indifference is the most insidious danger of all. Tonight, we're going to have a call to action for the church. We're releasing this not just to King Chapel. We're releasing it to America. Out of Alaska, out of the North Gate, we're releasing the message, the call to action. You know, Lou Engel says that back in that tent, we started an adoption movement that day. I think we just joined the heartbeat of God and a movement that had already begun in his heart. But you know what? Sometimes we have to initiate action on our own to be the answer to our own prayers. We can't just pray for the ending of abortion. We've actually got to rip the roof off, get to Jesus, and activate our faith for the ending of abortion. Tonight, we shape history by releasing the next phase of the adoption revolution here from Wasilla, Alaska. Now, tonight, uh, Lou would have loved to have been here with us, but he sent a little video. And so I just have a couple minutes of video from Lou. Do you have that ready? Good deal. Here's Lou. Lou the beautiful mountains of Colorado behind me can't compare to Alaska. Hey. Join with Randy and Kelsey Bolger in their great journey of releasing a million adoptions. I can say the turning point in my own journey concerning uh, abortion and adoption, I actually had a dream and a vision given to me about ending abortion, raising a prayer movement called Bound for Life. But the real turn took place when in D.C. we had been praying God end abortion, send revival to America. And at that time, we moved down to uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, actually, and uh, Kelsey B Boulder in a big tent preached her vision for the, it was not enough to pray for the ending of abortion. We needed to believe God for a million adoptions. She preached that message, and it riveted my heart, and from that point on, we've been praying for a million adoptions. And then what really captured me, they weren't just, uh, just dedicated to praying that prayer. They had to put feet to their prayers, and you know the story of Kelsey and Randy Boulder, how they adopted these amazing children, leading this Zoe movement for helping uh, fund uh, young couples that want to adopt, 
It's an amazing story. They're our friends. And then God led us on the journey where my wife actually got a small inheritance from her parents when they died. And she, uh, my wife, gave that money uh, to start an adoption agency. We said we've got to give ourselves to this. And then amazingly, just recently, at the send, 59,000 people, they called for a million adoptions. It's the answer to prayers for all these years. And I want to encourage Alaska, the A state, lead the parade of history raise up an adoption movement for the ending of abortion. I'm so thrilled that Kelsey is with you in these days. May it shift history. Love you all. Amen. Amen. You know what we're going to do before Kelsey comes back and continues? We're going to go ahead and receive a love offering for her and her ministry. And uh, what an opportunity to be able to give into this historic moment. So ushers, would you help us please? Because of the nature of what I believe the Lord wants to do, the latter part of this message, we want to be sure to give and sow into the Boldenders ministry. Amen? Amen. Wonderful. Four different ways to give once again. Just pray and ask the Lord what you should do. Hallelujah. If you're writing out a check, make it out to Kings or KC. And we will send on one check to for the entirety of what comes in towards them for the ending of abortion. It's quite a seed to sow. Amen. We have numerous families in the church that have adopted children, and we're so grateful for that. If you have a desire to be a part of that and participate, and really, anybody can participate, and everybody should participate in some way or another. Uh, you can give your resources. You can give your time. You can certainly pray. And perhaps uh, the Lord would call you to adopt some a child. And uh, if you have more a desire to know more about that, you can see Kelsey afterwards. There's some books out there, and they have a website. You can go and check that out. Ushers, would you come, please? I want to ask Minister Jan to pray over this. Um, you guys have adopted children and uh, have a heart for adoption. Part of our staff, Minister Jan, would you pray for this seed that we sow tonight? Father, we say yes to your heart tonight, Lord. Um, we are honored that you would lay the burden of your heart upon us. Father, because it means you trust us as your covenant ones. Father, I pray over this offering tonight that it would be multiplied beyond imagination. Father, that it would go further than uh, anyone can even imagine to end abortion in America today. We know, Lord, that it is going into rich good soil that honors you with everything. And we pray blessing upon it. And we pray for the Bolinders, Lord, that you would continue to anoint them and get this message out to everyone. And Lord, we accept the fact that to end abortion, we must be burdened, Father, and be uncomfortable. And I pray tonight that you would wreck this house and the hearts of people here for the needs of abortion of, of orphans, Father, and for the burden of ending abortion today, whatever it takes, we will be part of the people that say yes to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. And uh, if you're online, ushers, please, if you would, if you're online, you can give electronically as well, as we've expressed earlier in the service. You can participate in that. Wonderful. Put your hands together, please, for Kelsey Bolton. So from that day in the tent, <laughs> well, let me just tell you this funny little story. So the, how many of you heard Lou be, release the trumpet call for a million adoptions? Has anybody heard that? They did that at the Send just a few weeks ago, a million adoptions. And you would think that somewhere like 
we were in a back room with a whiteboard, you know, brainstorming ideas and, and you know, strategies. And actually, how that came about <laughs> is we were just in that tent. And Lou's assistant just walked by me. He's like, hey, you know, if there were a million adoptions in America, that would do it. That would silence the accuser. We're like, hey, let's call for a million adoptions. So the Lord can just give you a, an idea in a minute. Don't discount those ideas that you get in tents in South Carolina in the middle of July. <laughs> they can be anointed. So after we spent about the amount of money that we could purchase a pretty decent house on all the adoptions that we've done over the years, we decided, you know what? Wouldn't it be good to change the system? Yep. Wouldn't it be good to make adoption affordable for a normal family? You know, so you didn't have to spend $40,000 on an adoption. Right. So we were able to start an adoption agency that lowered that cost and gave grants to families and also really take care of birth moms. Because guess what? We can't just be all about the baby. We've also got to take care of mamas in crisis. You know what? Moms in crisis who, who want to go have an abortion, they need to be cared for. Their hearts need to be cared for. We can't just say, don't have an abortion. It's awful. We want your baby. No, we say, we love you. Jesus has a plan for your life. Your story isn't over. It's just beginning. Let us take your hand and walk you on the journey. And so that's what we wanted to do. There was a philanthropist in Cincinnati, this wealthy guy who had supported pro-life causes for 20 plus years. And he, he called us out of the blue. We didn't know him. He didn't really know us. And he said, hey, if you wanted to do that vision about that adoption agency and lowering the cost and all that stuff, if that was all funded, would you do it? And we're like, had to think about it for about five seconds. Yeah, I think we do it. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to fund you fully for a couple years, get this thing off the ground, because I've been given to pro-life for a long time, but I need to see something tangible. I want to fund a tangible ending to abortion. And so we started Zoe's House Adoption Agency in January of 2016. So we're going into our fourth year, our fourth full year, and we've already seen 22 babies saved and placed in families. And so we are just 22 babies placed. But how many, Becky, uh, over 120 moms served? So these are moms who were, uh, uh, some of them abortion-minded, and they just needed a little courage. They just needed to know, oh, there's resources out there? Oh, really? I can get free diapers if I have this baby? Oh, you mean I don't have to make an adoption plan because I'm poor? No, nobody should have to make an adoption plan because they're poor. Oh. They make an adoption plan because they believe that's what's best. And what we, you know, I, I, I have people all the time. In fact, I had, I had this woman come up to me at, it doesn't matter where. But she came to me and she said, so do you still have all those little orphans in your home? <laughs> and I'm like, Actually, my children were never orphans because what happened is there was this sacred exchange. There was this holy transaction where this mama said, I chose life and I'm giving them to you to be their new mom and dad, but I love you. And they were never orphaned. That's what this is all about. A sacred exchange, a holy transaction, the spirit of adoption at work. I want to put up this picture, the picture of the baby. This is Lucia Pearl. This is one of our Zoe babies from last year. If her birth mom would have lived in New York right now, I wouldn't have this picture to show you. Her birth mom, Jennifer, 
was a professional single mom from a very prominent family in our city. And she had a surprise pregnancy. And when she found out she was pregnant, she did what they, everybody did, all her friends do. She made the appointment at Planned Parenthood. She went into Planned Parenthood. She changed into the, the gown. She was on the table prepped for her abortion, and they have to do an ultrasound. And they did the ultrasound, and the tech said, I'm sorry, you can't have an abortion. You're 35 weeks pregnant. And she said, no, no, that can't be. I, I, I want a second ultrasound. I want a second technician. You're wrong. So a second technician came in, did the ultrasound, and they said, yeah, you're, you're right. She was wrong. You're 36 weeks pregnant. So, honey, you can get dressed whenever you want. You can leave. She said, no, 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 no. What am I going to do? And the Planned Parenthood nurse told her, we have no services for you now. You can get dressed and leave whenever you want. So she walked outside Planned Parenthood, which in our city is right off Roe Avenue, and she saw a sign, Advice and Aid Pregnancy Center. She said, I need some advice and aid. So she walked in, and they are a partner of ours, Precious Aww. Pregnancy Resource Center. They Aww. said, right down the street, you can go to Zoe's house, and they'll help you. And just two weeks before, I stood, because you know what, we're a nonprofit adoption agency, and I don't have a marketing budget. I don't have the marketing budget of all the big agencies that charge an arm and a leg and will place with any Bob and Jim out there. Do you hear that, what I'm saying? And I stood at my window off Roe Avenue and I pointed to Planned Parenthood and I said, God, you're my marketing strategist. If you call those mamas from Planned Parenthood, we'll take care of them. And two weeks later, Jennifer walked into our door, and she was, she was a mess. She said, I don't know what to do. What do I do? Can you help me? And my precious case manager said, yes, I'll help you. And she, she needed to keep it a secret. She's from a prominent family. Her family wouldn't understand. Her friends wouldn't understand. It would bring shame on them to do this again. She was already a single mom. And we were able to help her bring forth Lucia Pearl three weeks later and put her in the arms of this precious couple who had been dealing with infertility for years. And they named her Lucia Pearl because pearls are hidden. They're hidden away until they're ready to come forth. And God hid this little girl away. And she is the inheritance of Jesus. So turn to Malachi 4, just real quick. So here. When we started adopting and the Lord called us into this, it was not easy for me because I'm a revival girl. I have revival in my heart. I wanted to preach revival to the ends of the earth. And you know what the Lord dropped in my heart with angels at the coffee shop? Preach the spirit of adoption. Because that's how revival comes to America. Behold. Behold, I will send you the prophet Elijah. Before the coming of the day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Or else I'll come and strike the land with a curse. 
bam, 400 years of silence. What a way to end a book. In Zechariah 5, there's what I would call the worst curse in the whole Bible. It's not a curse of an earthquake or a plague. It's not a curse of, you know, poison water. In Zechariah 5, thieves and liars are cursed with being expelled from the city. You know what that means to a Jewish person? They're expelled from the very promises of God. Their, their access to heaven is restricted. The ceilings are low, the heavens are brass, and you cannot hear God. That's the curse that comes upon a land when the father's hearts are not turned to the children. You can't hear God. In Isaiah 1, verse 13, he says this to his people. His people, he's talking to his beloved. The ones he loves, the one he chose. He says, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. I can't, I can't do it when there's mixture among you. I can't do it when you say, come and consume God. All we are, I give you permission. My heart is really yours. I'll do whatever I want you to do. And then you just go do what you want to do. I, don't, I can't do the mixture, he says. Your solemn assemblies trouble me. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. And then he goes on to give the remedy. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and make a plea for the widow. It's not the only place. There's this farmer dude named Amos. I call him a reluctant prophet. He's a little bit like me. <laughs> reluctant prophet. It says in chapter 1 that he gave his message two and a half years or two years before the earthquake. I find this curious because God is very intentional about he, what he puts at the beginning of books. Read the first verses, even though they're the genealogies. There's something in there that God wants to speak. Amos got this two years before the earthquake because why? It's the mercy of God that he gave it two years before. He gave the people two years to respond. This earthquake, by the way, scientists say in 750 B.C., it was probably an 8-plus magnitude in the area of Lebanon, Israel, Jordan. It was the big one. You know, we're all waiting for the big one in California. This was the big one in the Middle East. The, Inter the International Creation Research Center, it says that uh, this was the legendary, it caused legendary urban panic. It was a crisis. It was the worst shaking in historical record. And it was the mercy of God to send a farmer prophet to say, hey guys, do this while you can. Seek the Lord and live. Seek good and not evil that you can live. And so the Lord of hosts will be with you. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. And it might be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you and gracious to the remnant of Joseph. In chapter 5, further down, after stating his displeasure, with their sacrifices and their solemn assemblies, God says this in verse 24, but let justice roll down like a mighty river and let righteousness like flow down like a flowing stream, an everlasting stream, a stream that doesn't end. And we've turned this into a prayer, haven't we? It's on greeting cards at the Christian bookstore. It's on bumper stickers. We, we stand in prayer meetings, oh God, let your justice roll down like a mighty river. Oh, let the, let the righteousness flow like an everlasting stream. And he says, no, that was my plea to you, not your plea to me. He says, I don't 
like your solemn assemblies when there's blood on your hands. You guys, if you want me to hear you, then you establish justice. You let justice roll down like a mighty river. You let justice, righteousness flow down like an everlasting stream. Do righteousness. Don't just come and sing to me about it. It's his plea to us. So how can we break that blockage of the river and release the mighty waters of justice to wash away the bloodshed of abortion? Well, history belongs to the intercessor, right? We become the answer by faith. We become the answer to our own prayer. We become the action and the establishment of justice on the earth. Adoption is a prophetic statement, not only to the world, but to the Lord. We do want the babies. We don't want to just stand and hold signs. We don't want to just have a prayer meeting, but actually we're going to do something about it. Because what if the Lord did help us out and give us a court, the court system that overturned Roe v. Wade and then in the States abortion was ended? What, what would happen? And we have babies upon babies that really weren't wanted be born. We have, to, we have to be ready. We have to already have said yes in our hearts, right? You know what the motto of Planned Parenthood is? I say is, it was. I didn't check today if it still is. Every child a wanted child. Yeah, you know why? Because they know not every child's a wanted child. So they, they invite abortion so that every child born can be a wanted child. You know what my motto is? Every child is a wanted child if you'll just... Bring them to life. We'll care for you and your baby. One of the biggest arguments of abortion advocates are you don't want them anyway. You don't want them any more than the mom does. And that's an indictment against the church because they're right. But until we rise up, in mass numbers, they're right. But it's happening. It's beginning to happen. There is a revolution of adoption happening. It's, 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 we're, the church is adopting in record numbers, in the, even in the last 10 years. It's been amazing what's happening. I hear stories. I think I hear more stories about adoption in this church than really anywhere I go. It's pretty amazing. So Jane came into our office one day. She, she passed by the post office and saw our sign. <laughs> At first she thought we were an adoption agency for puppies. A lot, of people, a lot of people call for puppies. In fact, a woman, this is kind of funny, but uh, our events coordinator was at an event one day last week representing Zoe's house, and a woman came up and said, oh, I'm so glad for all you're doing where do you keep your inventory? <laughs> and Stacy was like, uh, are you, don't you adopt dogs? No, no, we're babies, guys. This woman come in, comes in after watching or driving by the post office, and she said, I, I think I need help. I think it might be God's plan. She said, I went to have an abortion, and she showed my case manager her paperwork. In the state of Kansas, you ha it's a 24-hour waiting period. And so Planned Parenthood gets around that by saying, when you make your appointment, they say, okay, and by the way, you have to print out your paperwork with a timestamp 24 hours before your appointment. And so she brought her paperwork in, and she forgot to print her paperwork out till that morning. And so she took it in with like a 7.30 a.m. timestamp for a 9 a.m. appointment for an abortion. And they said, oh, we can't do your abortion now until tomorrow because of the timestamp. And she's like, 
I think that might have been God's sign that I'm not supposed to have an abortion. So she drove by the post office and came in our office. And Christina took this woman to her, um, Christina started helping her. She's my case manager. She used to be my nanny, by the way. She also used to work for Bound for Life. She also used to stand at the court in D.C. and pray for the ending of abortion. And now the Lord has her serving birth moms and, and making adoption plans with these women. That's how God answers our prayers. So she started caring for this woman, and uh, she took her to her next OB appointment. And, and they, she picked her up at her house. They started on the way, and the girl was telling her where to go. And Christina realized, oh, my goodness, we're pulling into the abortion doctor's parking lot. Oh, my goodness, the... The appointment is with the abortion doctor. Oh, my goodness, she's also an OB doctor. And Christina realizes she, is, she prayed for this woman by name in D.C. when she would stand at the court. They get in, and Christina's sitting there in the room, kind of stunned at where she is. She's, you know, they have their appointment, and the doctor looks at Christina and says, Wow, you've really taken really good care of her. I wonder if I could have some of your cards to put in my office because sometimes my women want to have adoption, an adoption option. We've tried to get cards in that office for four years. You know, thank you, Jesus. That's the answer to prayer. That woman was able to have her baby make an adoption plan. You know what the doctor told her? Because she said, yeah, my... I'm adopted. My dad's a doctor, too. Well, what Christina, Christina did not know this woman was adopted. She did know that her dad ran the abortion clinic. So what is God up to in Kansas City? We're just looking to see those doctors overcome with the spirit of adoption. It's the gospel of Jesus. So adoption is the extension of our intercession by faith. We talked a little bit about the seeds of faith the other night. You know what? We can hold seeds. My, my, my little guy, Scout, he loves seeds. He just grabs onto a subject and, and we'll talk about it forever. He loves seeds. He'll hold seeds. But he knows he wants to plant it. He knows you can't, you can't get that thing out of the seed unless you put it in the dirt and water it, right? Because that's the only time it's going to grow. We, can't, we can hold the seed in our hand all day long. We could pray over the seed. We can cry over the seed. But until we activate the seed, it doesn't produce fruit. Your yes, whatever that means, will bear fruit. I want to tell you how you can be a part of the adoption revolution, how you can say yes. One way, what, now, let me just be really clear. The, the adoption movement in America is like this big, and I'm talking about this much of it, okay? Because I'm talking about the adoption of babies who might have been aborted, whose mothers may have been abortion-minded, okay? And we're doing it for the purpose of making a prophetic statement to the Lord and to the world that we want the babies. We will care for them. That This is one way. So you can actually adopt. The Lord may be calling you to adopt. You may be 25 and not married. You might be 12 and not married. But if you say yes, the Lord can water that seed in your heart. And when you're ready, he will make it happen. You might be newly married and say, well, we want to have bio kids someday. You know what? I, I'm seeing this revolution of young couples all across America who are saying, you know what? We want to adopt now. You know, and you know what? Most of, my, most of my birth moms, not all, but most of my birth moms, when they choose a family, they want to choose some, well, a lot of them want to choose a family, a young couple, in their 20s or 30s, who do not have children who, or who haven't been able to have children. And so that's what we look for a lot. We're, we're like, a, we have a shortage of those kind of people right now. 
I have a lot of people my age, well, not with 10 kids, but, you know, with, with other kiddos who are saying yes, and we love that. But I, the, these young mamas, I think they just want, I think they just want to choose someone like them. So I just speak to you young couples, if, if the Lord is stirring your heart for this, and you say yes, don't be afraid of the barriers. Don't be afraid of the cost. Don't be afraid. Just say yes, because your yes will bear good fruit. You can be a part of the revolution by, I know this sounds trite, but you can actually give up your resources, give up your money to help other families. It's costly. Not every agency, not every adoption will, will be affordable. To the, to the regular family. But we have a grant. There's grant funds out there that need money to give to families. We have a grant fund. We have, we have young families who are saying yes to this, saying we can't adopt right now, but we want to give $25 a month to your grant fund or to, to Zoe's house so that you can serve expectant moms and adoptive families with the, with the love of Christ. And, there's, and you know what? It really makes a difference. That's one way you could do it. If you're a professional, a medical professional, an attorney, a social worker, you know what? I have to pay people big bucks to do those kinds of services for us because we have to be compliant. We have to work within the law. You know why we have adoption law? So we don't have human trafficking of babies. That's why it costs so much because we actually have to pay those people. You can help a family. You know, adoptive families need help. I had a bunch of little people running around, and I just needed help, not so I could go out and, and you know, go on a date. I just needed to take a shower. <laughs> I'm like, could y'all just watch these guys so they don't burn down the house while I'm in the shower? <laughs> Find an adoptive family. Help them. Serve them. Let them go on a date. Whatever they need. Just give them a little help. Finally, be a voice. Don't be silent. Use your voice. Use your your silly Instagram, instead of putting latte art on your Instagram, put something out there about the adoption revolution in America. And I just want to encourage you with our own story, because sometimes it's all I got. <laughs> you, I got a bunch of pictures back there. If you can start with the orange sweatshirt girl, I want to show you. This is the fruit of so much intercession. This is God's mercy. This is God's inheritance. We are stewarding another man's inheritance, folks. This, Zoe, you know what? Her birth mom, her birth mom was a dancer in Las Vegas. Let the reader understand. It is a miracle that she was carried to term. You know what? When I stood in that tent in South Carolina and released this message and prayed for the ending of abortion, Zoe was in her mother's womb. We were prophesying over Zoe that day. And her mama chose life. And she's the one that Randy says made us want all the others. That's our Zoe. Next one. The twins. Look at these girls. This is Anna River and Mercy Rain. And we got a call about them. We were, in, we were at the call Orlando in uh, February of 2008. And I preached on adoption. And Jesse Engel came to me afterwards and he said, Kelsey, you guys got to do this again. You guys got to, you, you got to be ready for an emergency. What if, what if an emergency comes up? You're not going to be ready. You got to get your home study ready. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll pray about that. Then while we're in Florida, we get a text message from my friend Tracy. She was an adoption consultant. She, she said, you got to call me. I called her. She's crying. She said, Kelsey, you've got to pray. I need families who are ready. I had to turn away three babies who are lying in the nursery at the hospital because nobody is ready for them. She said, I've had 16 situations this week, 16 babies, and three of them I can't find a family for. Because you know what? 
Not every lady is the perfect blonde haired, blue eyed uh, compliment to the mid America family. I actually had, oh, my husband had a woman call and she called the agency and said, Yeah, yeah, we're really interested in adopting. And I'm just wondering, could you get us a blonde haired, blue eyed little girl? Because she'd really go with our family. Wrong answer. This is Anna and Mercy. They are Japanese, Thai, Caucasian. And look at how beautiful they are. Uh, we, we went ahead and got our home study ready, and we told the social worker, we, uh, we're just getting ready. We don't have a baby in mind. I, we're, we're not being presented to agencies. And she thought we were off our rocker because we said, would you rush this? We kind of waited too long, and we feel like the Lord is asking us to pay you 500 extra dollars to rush this. She's like, okay, I'll do it, but we're like, no, 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 you really need to do this. So that was on a, on a Monday, we turned in everything. She rushed it. Wednesday night at 7 p.m., she emails us, here's your home study, let me know if you need anything. 6 a.m. the next morning, my husband's in a prayer meeting. Be careful of those prayer meetings. And he gets a, a comment on his blog, please pray for my sister-in-law. She just had twins in Pensacola, Florida. And they're going to go to foster care this afternoon if we don't find a family for them. And he tracked the guy down, and he said, we'll take them. We're ready. So we got on a plane that afternoon, and we went to get our babies. And we were in Dallas, and a friend called and said, well, are they boys or girls, and what race are they? We're like, we forgot to ask. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it'll be a surprise. <laughs> and we got there, and the mama, um, she's mentally ill and from marijuana use. And, yeah, yeah, it's true. And she took us to the nursery, and she wheeled them out. I don't know how she did this. Wheeled them out of the nursery with us, wheeled us into a broom closet, and we're like, oh, my Lord, if anybody finds us in here with this woman, we are so arrested. <laughs> she takes them out of the bassinet. She kisses them on the head, places one in one, Randy's arm, one in my arm. And she said, I love you, baby girls. Here's your mom and your daddy. And then six weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. Because <laughs> God is really funny. <laughs> A couple of years later, I was washing the dishes. And Randy came in with this look on his face like he had just swallowed a toad. And he said, I just got a phone call from their birth, their bio auntie, that um, their mama, birth mama, was <clears throat> had been living in a U-Haul storage unit in Fort Walton Beach. And the, the, the storage unit manager had to kick her out because she can't live in a storage unit. And when he called, her, her next of kin was on the agreement, called her sister and said, yeah, I wanted you to know what happened, but you also need to know she's really, really pregnant. And I don't know where she went. And so Randy said, I got to go find her. And I'm like, Oh, good Lord, I have all these babies already. He said, yeah, we got to go get her. So we flew out to Fort Walton Beach, and we drove around, and we prophesied. We're here. Your mom and dad are here. Because we, we knew they wouldn't let her keep these babies. But we said, we're here. And Randy wanted to name the, the first set of twins. Oh, by the way, they were twins. Randy wanted to name the first set of twins Creed and Cadence, and I said, that's too out there. How about just Anna and Mercy? So this time, 
It was 117, 2012. Lou Ingalls in the prayer room, and he's prophesying Luke 117 and an adoption movement to end, end abortion. And we got the phone call. Sorry, I'm rambling the story. <laughs> we get in the plane. We go to Fort Walton Beach. We drive around and prophesy. And we're like, creed and cadence. I said, we might as well now. We're crazy now. <laughs> creed and cadence, we're here. Creed Elijah, cadence Aliana. God has answered, and we're here. And she, she actually got Baker acted, that, which means she got put in the, the, the psych ward until the babies were born because she might have been a harm to herself or others. And uh, her, her, we would sit in the little prayer chapel in the hospital with um, uh, Bio Uncle, and Bio Auntie would go in and see Amy, and I, I said, I don't know what to do here in this prayer chapel. Let's just pray the red letters. <laughs> you ever do that? When you're out of prayers, you pray the red letters, okay? So we're praying, you know, Jesus, you set the demoniac free, you know, all these things because she's, you know, loopy and saying things. And, and we're, we're, we're just praying the red letters, and she's texting us from being in the psych ward saying, I don't know what you're praying, but keep praying it because she's saying that, uh, when the, tell them to quit praying because when they pray, the voices can't speak to me anymore. We're like, keep praying the red letters. <laughs> so we kept praying the red letters, and she calmed down. And she had the babies, and she was able to once again make a holy transaction. And creed and cadence were brought to life. Are they not the most beautiful? They're Japanese, Thai, Puerto Rican. <laughs> They're awesome. And then... We thought, wow, we have nine kids. That's really crazy. And uh, here's a scoop. With Creed and Cadence, she actually walked in at one point to a pregnancy resource center, and they helped her get groceries, get some clothes. What if she would have walked into Planned Parenthood mentally ill? The only services they had to offer Jennifer was abortion. What would they have offered for Creed and Cadence? So then I just thought, okay, I have nine kids. I'm going to get my college degree. I didn't do it when I was 21. I might as well do it now because <laughs> it's not going to get any, you know, calmer anytime soon. So I remember studying for finals one day on my bed in my bedroom, and Randy came in on the phone, and he had that same swallowed a toad look on his face. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And he said, okay, Rob, yeah, yeah, I'll talk to Kelsey. I know Rob. Yeah, Rob's in Florida. He's our attorney. <laughs> I knew it was coming. He said, yeah, the social worker at the, at the hospital just broke HIPAA, and she called me, and she said, you know, your birth mom, she just had another baby, little boy, and I think they're going to hotline her. And we're like, not under my watch. <laughs> So I immediately flew down to Florida, and I called the social worker. I said, I'm here. I ha we have the other four children. Four children? Yeah, I, I lose count. And uh, the social, you know what she told me? She said, that's not how it works down here in Florida. I'm like, oh, really? Have you read your statute that said that under Florida statute, you actually have to look for either the next of kin or the adoptive family of the adopted children? Oh, no, I, I didn't read that. They had already hotlined him and assigned him to another family in the foster care system. So this was going to be a little more tricky. But you know what? You know what? This is what Randy said. He said, how can we not fight for him? How can we not, when, our, when Anna and Mercy are 15, how can we look them in the eyes and said that we're more like you, but we didn't get them? So we started fighting the only way we knew to do, intercession. And then we looked up the looked up uh, the Supreme Court justice in the state of Florida, got his cell phone number and called him. Yeah, amen. You got to do what you got to do. You got to rip the roof off 
because you got to get to Jesus because I can't go back. I got to get to him. And so long story short, after three months, Scout was three months old. Well, here's a crazy thing. His bio aunt and uncle moved, moved from Virginia, moved their whole family to Florida to be the next of kin. And they said, we're here. We'll take him until these guys can take him. So they set up temporary residence, spent thousands and thousands of dollars to invest in this little boy's life, took him in, and a month later, after us pounding on the gates of heaven and pounding on the gates of the Supreme Court of Florida, some judge said, just let the Bolenders take him home. And the state of Florida waived their custody to us. Scout Caleb Justice. And let me tell you guys, this, you know what? Opportunity to change the world does not come at a convenient time for anybody. Okay? I was in the middle of finals. I had to prepare papers, cook dinner for nine kids, get them to school, do life, fight for this kid. Because opportunity to change history rarely comes at a convenient time. You got to do what you got to do. And you know what? It also, it's also rarely cheap to change history. You know what? With Scout, we went to the soccer game. And uh, we were telling some folks. And they're like, oh, don't you think there's other people that could take him? Because they were reasoning with us. You guys have a lot on your plate, you guys. I mean, oh, my gosh. Nobody would say anything if you said no. Well, it's like Pastor Daniel said. Reason is the guillotine of your faith. And I just had to go, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. And I had a soccer mom hear the story and say, oh, that's really great of you guys. Are they going to take care of that for her? You know what I mean? They gonna take care of her? I said, you mean like Hitler? Like Hitler did? Sterilize the mentally ill? No. No. Nobody's asking for that to happen. God's just saying, when the opportunity comes, will you rise up and take care of the little ones? Because he sets the lonely in families. I had a dream not too long ago. Uh, and in the dream... Well, so in, in, in my city, in Overland Park, Kansas, there's a street called Roe Avenue. And, and we purposely put our adoption agency right off Roe Avenue, right by Planned Parenthood, close. And I had a dream that I was walking to the end of Roe. I, st I literally started walking at the south end. Yeah, worship team, come on up. And I started walking north on Roe. And I went through the rich neighborhoods and the poor neighborhoods and the industry uh, uh, sector. And I got to almost the end, and there was a big pile of boulders and dirt, and there was a, like a blockage. It was, I couldn't get to the end, and I called Randy in the dream. I said, I can't get to the end. There's a big roadblock. He said, come home and we'll regroup. And I went back home in the dream because I knew we had to pray because we were committed to walking to the end of Roe. And I think that roadblock can be kicked down if the church rises up to action. You know what? Winston Churchill once said, history is going to be kind to me because I intend to write it. Well, me and Winston, we're going to change history. We're going to write history. Who else wants to write history tonight? Stand up with me. Here's what I want to ask. I've got a, a couple different calls of action here. If you are a family and you specifically are feeling the call to adoption, now be reminded this is not a romantic thing, okay? Okay. Don't get all romantic on me. It's not easy. If you're saying, I think I, we might be called to adoption, I would just like you to come up and line this, 
This is the, this is where you get healing for infertility, right? This is the child section. Just come on up and stand. If you are, say, 18 or under, and you're saying, I want to be a part of the adoption revolution, I want you to come stand over here. And I'm talking kiddos. Up to 18. I want to pray a special blessing on you guys right here. Father in heaven, you see these precious ones who have said yes. They've said yes. Oh God, take their yes. Make it fruitful. Bring provision. Open up the floodgates, God, that they would be the answer to the ending of abortion in America. Father, we ask for massive provision. We ask for the fire of God. We ask, God, that you would open doors for the adoption movement here in Alaska. Fan the flame right now, and may it not be quenched. And for you guys, you are the generation that will change history. Your yes is going to write history. And you'll be written in the book of life. So, Father, I just pray, God, that you would bless these ones, God. Set them aflame. Set them aflame with revival through adoption the spirit of adoption on their lives and their hearts, God. The spirit of adoption released, God, for a mighty movement in America. The spirit of adoption on you, little one. Jesus, release it. Release it in your name. Now I just want to invite the rest of you who just want to respond. Maybe you're not called to adopt. Maybe you just say, I can't do that, but I say yes to whatever I can do for the adoption revolution. I say yes to the ending of abortion in America. Maybe you could give a family a date night. Maybe you can give five, ten bucks a month to a family who wants to adopt. Come forward and let's just sing to the Lord and consecrate ourselves for this movement in Jesus' name.
those online, all across this place, let the Holy Spirit just touch you. He's talking to many. He's talking to you. Just say yes and yield to Him, His plan. Before we conclude our service, I feel so impressed by the Holy Spirit to um, to pray for healing. For those of you who have been uh, affected going to say this as graciously as I can. Those of you who have been affected by abortion. So we've counseled and helped and met with people, prayed with people who were supposed to be aborted and weren't. We have spent time with people who have been through the horrible decisions in their youth and different times in their life where they aborted a baby and came to the realization after becoming a Christian, many of them, that they, that they murdered their own child. And to see the heartache that people go through, and it brings a curse. You know, many people, they come to Christ, but they... You know, they don't really, um, we have a tendency to just want to quickly go over things like, you know, it's okay. You know, it's okay. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Well, it's under the blood. If, if it's under the blood, it's under the blood. And that's an important thing. I mean, I'm not a woman, okay, so obviously. Kelsey, would you help me? Because I can, I can hear the word of the Lord over, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, to, to lead with this. And I, I don't want to be insensitive. But at the same time, I can see the hand of the Lord wanting to come and to heal. Even, even, even I see the Lord wants to heal some of the, the women that are here, perhaps online, physically. That you've physically been wounded because of abortion. And some of you still carry those scars, whether it be emotionally or even physiologically. And the Lord wants to touch and heal you. And not only the women, but the men, the dads who have been involved in abortion. Can I just say, just want you to come here. I don't want to put you on the spot. But she just told me, you know, during a hard time, she contemplated abortion. And I just want to stand here and I want to repent to you as the church and repent to women 
on the web stream in this woman, in this room, women and men who have contemplated abortion or had abortion, I repent on behalf of the church for not being there for you. For not rising up and giving you courage and being the message of life to you, to you. We're just sorry, God. Father, we are sorry. And for you, if you are going through the heartache, even at the heartache of contemplating, the Lord forgives. The Lord, he's full of mercy. He's full of mercy and long suffering. So you can just whisper to him right now, help me, forgive me. Holy Spirit, do what you do. Love on those, Jesus, who have that wound. Wipe away the shame. Wash away the shame in Jesus' name. I hear the Lord singing. I'll never forget you. I'll always be with you. Be healed. I promise to love you. Bodies be healed. Emotions be healed. Never forget you. I'll always be with you. I promise to love you with all of my heart. Jesus. The song of the Lord. Thank you. The song of the Lord over you. Hear him singing over you tonight. I'll never forget. I'll always be with you. I promise to love you with all of my heart. I never forget you. I'll always be with you. I promise to love you, my son, with all of my heart. If you're here under the sound of my voice and you've not given your heart to Jesus, we never close our services without giving an opportunity, or should I say rarely, because this might be the last time you ever hear the good news, that you can be forgiven of your sin. You can be washed and you can be cleansed. You can be born again, made anew. You can have all of your sins forgiven and thrown as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says if you can believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. It says in, 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 in the Bible that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved in the book of Acts. It says to as many as believed on Him, believed on Jesus, He gave them the right to become children of God. Do you know we've all been adopted? <laughs> That's the gospel. The gospel is adoption. That's what it is. Thank God. Thank God he adopted us. Isn't that amazing? You know, maybe you've not received your, your, your adoption papers. Well, why don't you just need to sign them yourself? You just need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's what you need to do. He's reaching out to you today. He's reaching out across, across the airwaves. Right now, every, every head bowed, every eye closed. You say, that's me, Pastor. I've never, I've never been adopted. I've never had my sins for you. were separated from God because of sin. But your sin has been paid for because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Been paid for. Sin and sickness and disease. It's been taken care of. You just need to receive your adoption papers. Can I say it that way? And your, your papers are by believing on Him and confessing with your mouth. If you've never done that, want to receive Jesus today for your first time, or maybe you did that before at a kid's camp or a youth camp. You know you're not living for him, so you want to come home. You want to receive Jesus afresh and anew. You want to recommit. You want to sell out. Not live a half-hearted, compromised life, but live all the way for God. You say, that's me, Pastor. Wonderful. 
If that's you on the count of three, I want you to slip your hand up all across this place, those online. Want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time or make a recommitment all across this place. If that's you, count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Do it right now. God bless you, my goodness. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God, God bless you, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you all the way in the back. God bless you. Over on this side, raise your hand high. God bless you, son. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand. God bless you. You know what we're going to do? Can we just make a little bit of room? If you are serious and you raised your hand and you really want to get right with God, you're not playing church, you're not messing around. I don't want to embarrass you, but I know this. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. So if you raised your hand or you didn't, and you know you need to be included in this prayer, as soon as our beloved sister begins to sing, get out from where you are and meet me right here. Come on, come right now. Come on, come. Meet me right here. Come as close to my hand as you can. Come on. Come on, move on all up in here. People are coming from the back. Come on, come. If you're online, you let us know you're getting right with God right now. Leaders, pastors, come please. Come all the way up front. Come on, just slide right in this way. Come, 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 come. Awesome. It's a brand new day. Come on, step up just a little closer. Fill up in here. Lord, I give you my heart. give you my soul. Live for you. I live. of you up here look at me come on let me see your eyes just look at me a moment all across this place let me have your attention so we're going to pray a very simple prayer and in praying that prayer every sin that you've ever done every sin you've ever committed is going to be forgiven and washed away the bible says that all who call upon the name of the lord shall be saved it's a gift. It's a gift. You, don't, you can't earn it. If you could earn it, Jesus would never have to come and die on a cross. You have to repent. Re. Again, think. Rethink again. You think, I'm going to live differently. I'm going to ask for, for forgiveness for what I've done. Have you ever lied before? Yes. You ever stolen? Uh-huh. You ever lusted? You know that's right. You ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Yes. Welcome to being a human being. Every single one of us have failed. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift, the what? The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You receive that by faith. Confident assurance of what He did for you and me. So you're going to pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Those online, those here in the congregation, all of you up front, pray this right out loud, right after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place and to rise again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin for everything I've ever done wrong. I'm sorry. Come into my life tonight. Come into my heart tonight. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Write my name in your book in heaven give me a hunger for your word a hunger for the things of God thank you for loving me thank you for hearing my prayer universal sign of surrender is lifting your hands just lift your hands to heaven and say yes to him I'm gonna pray for you come on lift your hands to heaven all across this place I pray right now a breaking of every curse a shattering of every chain generational iniquity we break by the power of the name of the blood of jesus lord 
pour out your spirit now. Fill these now with your precious Holy Spirit. Just let the Lord touch you. I want my team to just move through and lay hands. Listen, you need the power of God. You need the power of this. It takes God to live for God. He's touching you. He's healing you. Let him touch you. Let him heal you right now. Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Pastors, ministers, quickly go. Go for it. Be free tonight from every bondage. Be healed tonight from all the wounds. Yes, Lord. Be healed. Be filled with the Spirit tonight. Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Your touch. Holy Ghost! Touch right now! Be free! Give me a shot. from the dead. Be filled. Be filled. That's it. That's it. More. More. Fire from the
make it your prayer. Just a few more moments. You welcome in my heart. You welcome in my Holy Spirit. Invite tonight. Holy Spirit. You welcome in my heart. You welcome in my life. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, come and invade homes tonight on the East Coast. And decision makers, that you, Lord, would trouble them. Even, the Lord says, even as I spoke to Pilate's wife, I am speaking behind the scenes. And I am bringing a troubling to consciences that were seemingly seared. And I'm causing an awakening because of the prayers of the saints. And as you've been decreeing a thing, it is going to be established. And there will be an overthrowing and an overturning. And there will come a great release of my power and my grace behind the scenes to see it come to pass. I'm removing who needs to be removed. I'm putting in place who needs to be put in place. I've set things up. Don't be weary in well-doing for in due time, in due time, you will see it with your own eyes says the Lord fire fire on the Supreme Court on the White House on every house
Becky Jackman, God bless you. I don't know where you're at. I know you're here. There you are. God bless you. You've been so kind to us. My family, you've opened your home, allowing us to be in, at the International House of Prayer for periods of time that's affected. This is part of that fruit, you know. Half the story is yet to have been told. You made some decrees. They're on my desk. I just sent somebody to go get them. Because in the closing moments, I'm just gonna I'm gonna turn those things loose. We're just gonna just gonna make those. There's there's power in a declaration. When it comes from the throne, it releases his kingdom, his power to see it come to pass. We just did one. Roe versus Wade will be overthrown. It's your will, it's your plan. Overthrow the ending of abortion in the name of Jesus. Do it, God. Thank you, Minister Barry. Fire! Fire, fall down, Thank you. fire, fall down on us, we pray. We decree the turning of the tide of the culture of death that has emulated the Supreme Court for over the last 50, 50 years. Turn the tide. I want you to say that. Turn the tide for the glory of God. We decree the gate of the Supreme Court is closed to further unrighteousness and national harm. Come on, somebody say that with me. We decree the gate of the Supreme Court is closed to further unrighteousness and national harm in the name of Jesus. And we decree that the gate of the Supreme Court is open to God. Say it. We decree the gate of the Supreme Court is now open to God. We speak life to the gate of the Supreme Court. Turn the tide tonight in Jesus' name. And we declare the Supreme Court to be a place of godliness and holiness and righteousness, truth and justice, and life to flow into this nation. Come on, somebody ought to say hallelujah. <laughs> ah, lift your hands and rejoice. We decree it thus and so for the glory of God. Let your fire fall in fire. The Holy Spirit is touching, touching kids up here. It's just a beautiful thing. Come on, lift your hands all across this place online. There's no distance in the Spirit. Let the Lord touch you on the end of your device, your computer, in your home. God, we just thank you. We thank you that this word being released, even from the great Northland. We thank you for the amazing release of your power your kingdom the death is turned by the power of the name of jesus we thank you for a spirit of adoption for without it we would not be sons and daughters of god release now release now a fresh touch upon the church of the living god the ecclesia Release boldness in prayer rooms across the land. For the enemies on the ropes, God, that you dealt the knockout punch. And we, Lord, are here to enforce it and decree it and proclaim it. We will not be silent. We will not be a people of apathy and lethargy, no. We will be loud. Like a megaphone from heaven. We will stand. We will vote. We will decree life and even life forevermore the kingdom of god is at hand we declare sickness infirmity disease you have no authority and we drive out the spirit of death and abortion out of our nation by faith tonight in the name of jesus 
shout to God. Come on, with a voice of triumph. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Eight days straight of church we've had. This is our eighth service. I think, I think that's got some, some significance. The Lord is great. Let me bless you. Our service will be concluded. Father, thank you for all that you've done over these, this past week plus. The stories will be We'll see them in newspapers. We'll, we'll hear the testimonies. We will not shrink back. For we've been cleansed from the former things. Now to be used for noble purposes. Cleansed by the blood. Washed. Free. Loosed. Let your fire rest upon us. Upon the nation. He had this holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside just a closing chorus. Now I I still wonder show me who you are and lead me with your Lord and lead me in your love to those of around one more time holy Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. the declaration over your own life. I will. I will my life your love. It is a foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be state decree it
Come on, just pray in the Spirit. I know we've gone long, but there ain't nothing on TV, and God's moving here. Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He's talking to his people. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church. He's talking to his people. And I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will hear their land. God, we pray. Let a mighty wave of repentance from sea to shining sea, every mountain, every valley be brought low. Crooked places be straight. Let a mighty wave of repentance come through our great country. From the north to the south and the east to the west and all the territories. Bring an awakening, God, of the body of Christ. Bring a turning of wicked ways and a great outpouring, even a reformation. God, do it, we pray. We thank you that, that we will do our part from the Northland to pray the prayers, to release the incense, to make the decrees, to live the life worthy of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We affirm once again that that is the reason we breathe. That is the reason we're here. We will follow through by the grace and the power of the Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus, let me... Let me close and bless you. Father, thank you. Bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance towards us, God. Be gracious to us. Keep us and give us peace. God bless you. Thanks for turning out. Thanks for serving in the way that you do. Thanks for loving the way you do. God bless you. Wednesday night, revival continues. Tuesday night, transformations. You can be a part of that too. We love you. God bless you. We'll hope to see you this week. Hallelujah. Amen.